So thank you very much for the invitation. Well, first of all, I was never a forester. I was always looking for uh, at the grasslands, although I'm from Brazil. And I was very lucky to have master and PhD advisors who were grassland grasslands lovers. So I was always looking down, not never looking up. Um, and I, I'm ha sometimes I'm, I'm afraid to talk after Giselda because she gives such great talks. But she introduced a little bit what I'm going to talk about. Um, I will talk about fire, which is nowadays, it's the hot, really hot topic. But you have to think that I'm not going to talk about a tropical forest where, uh, which is a fire sensitive ecosystem. It's not a fire adapted ecosystem or a fire prone ecosystem. So when we look at the map from Brazil, we see that we have different kinds of vegetation. Of course, every time we go to another country and you talk about Brazil, everybody asks if you work with forests, of course. But we have, as Giselda showed it so beautifully, we have several areas in Brazil where we have grasslands and savannas, which are very rich in plant species and also in animal species. So I'm going to talk more about the Cerrado, which is my home, um, which is an well, Giselda already introduced it a little bit. Has, it's a neotropical savanna with a very marked uh, season, uh, seasonality. You have dry season, but it's not a dry ecosystem as many people think. It's a mesic savanna. It rains a lot in comparison to other places in the world, like the African savanna, for example. And it's the richest tropical savanna in the world when we are talking about plant species. And most of the species, they have traits related to, dry, to, the, dry, to, the, to the seasonality or to fire. Um, and Giselda showed a picture, I think, from the same place because we were together here. So this place burned three, two months before we went to this place. So you see everything flowering. And you can see the dominance of C4 grasses and it's very rich in forb species, so, every so when you go to the Sahara, you, you really have to look down. And of course, you also have lots of shrubs and what we call uh, underground trees, because most of the, the biomass will be below ground. So you have a very uh, beautiful underground system in the Sahara where most of the carbon is. That's why these ecosystems are so important for carbon sequestration. And of course, when I say fire is, import, is an important driver, sometimes people want to kill me because they don't like fire. But that's the thing in the Sahara. It's really, and not only ecological, but also evolutionary factor. And not only for the Sahara, but for other tropical and um, uh, grasslands and savannas in the world. The major problem we have in the Cerrado is not the fire nowadays. Um, it, it can be the wildfires, but it's the change in land use that we are seeing lately. That's why I really don't like the savanna, savannization term. Because every time people say like this, people believe that savannas are not natural and people think that they are degraded. And that's why we have most of the Cerrado already degraded and changed in other land uses, like um, planted pastures, cultivation, plantation of pine, because people think we need trees in the savanna and we don't. And of course, one of the major problems we have nowadays in the savannas are the invasion of African grasses. So all of this make it the restoration of Sahad very difficult. And I will tell you why. I will try to, to tell you why. So Lele already showed this map. It makes us very angry when we see these people telling that all these places where you have beautiful grasslands and savannas are should be, we should plant trees there because they are beautiful ecosystems and we don't need these trees there. And of course, this opportunity for landscape restoration is always planting trees for restoration. And they talk about a lot of hectares, but almost half of these areas are formed by grassy biomes where you usually don't have trees at all. So, 
this year, after a long time, we could publish this paper. And I think it's very important because it talks about resilience and restoration of these kind of ecosystems. And uh, we try to discuss all possible drivers and, and all possible problems we could face trying to restore these grasslands. And I think our major point conclusion is we still don't know how to do this very well. So of course it's easier to plant trees than to bring back the herbaceous layer of these areas. And of course, we have these beautiful pictures, but what I wanted to show is that most of the, the drivers and restoration pathways that we can use to have back the grasslands is fire. So we have to talk about fire in these uh, systems. So I will try to put some of the points that fire can influence, can be maybe a good restoration tool, or at least we have to take to consider when we talk about restoration. And first of all, I will talk about fire suppression. And this is a big problem because this is a very nice paper from Giselle and her group that showed two years ago that, great, when you have this natural process happening in the place that you have the shrub encroachment and you have the change of the grassland or the savanna into a forest ecosystem, we're gaining carbon, right? Because we have trees, so we have a lot of carbon in the system. Yes, it's right. They show it very beautifully here. So you have these changes in the vegetation from our open to forest, and you have a gain in carbon. But what is the cost of gaining carbon in the system? The cost is that we lose a lot of biodiversity in the system. It's like 80 and 90% almost of uh, losing species that are typical from savanna because they are just changing into forest species. And um, the problem is we lose these species and how do we get these species back to the system? That's the question that we have to ask when we are doing restoration. Another study from, from Giselda and her student as well showed that. Another problem is about water. When you have shrubbing, when you have a tree, when it's raining and you're in the grassland, you get wet. When it's raining and you're in the forest, you don't get that wet because trees are intercepting this rain as well. So we have problems with the water recharge. And if you think that in Cerrado, we have most of the water that provide us uh, in Brazil, this is a serious problem. And maybe this is some, something we can use to convince people that we cannot let all the places encroach because then we, we have some problems with the water. And there is another problem that this is the one that we always see in the news during this time of the year, the wildfires, I'm not talking about Amazon wildfires, talking about the other wildfires in the savanna-like ecosystems, is because when we have fire exclusion, we have an increase in biomass. And this biomass is flammable and it will burn a lot. So the more we exclude from fire, the more we have in biomass to burn. And, by, and the fire will be completely different if, if we burn here and if we burn here. So it will have different consequences. So that's what happened 2017. Maybe you're not that aware, but I think yes, because it was a lot in the Facebook, please help Chapada dos Viadeiros, it's burning and everything. And what happens is that this park had the fire zero policy, like most of the parks in Brazil, no burning, we are good doing fire breaks, we are extinguishing all fire that happens. So 2010 was a year of a lot of mega fires in Brazil, everything burned. And of course, then you can see the other years, they could exclude fire, but it's impossible to exclude fire for a long period. So 2017, it burned almost 80% of the park again, and it was a wildfire. And if you look here in this map, so the, these are the areas that burned 2017. The green areas are the areas that were not burned since 2010. So you can see most of the areas that really burned in 2017 were the areas that they could exclude since 2010. So this is a, a huge problem. So another huge problem is invasive species. And this is a problem that I don't know how to deal. So, if you have an invasive species in your site and you, you want to use fire to restore or you have fires in your place while you're doing restoration, you're going to have big problems. This is a brachiaria place where you have little chloe species, usually planted as pastures. And when you have brachiaria within the Cerrado vegetation, you have 
more intense fires, you have hotter temperatures, and you have higher flames, which means that sometimes you can have your trees killed, top killed by this fire, which otherwise would not be top killed because usually fire in the Sahad is very fast, so the flames are not that high, because Urocloa can accumulate a lot of biomass and very fast, and that's the problem with this invasive species. Um, and then when we talk about restoration, how we do restoration. So we add seeds to the, to the area. We try to bring some soil from other places. So in the Cerrado, we have two main regeneration strategies after disturbance, which is the plants will germinate or they will re-sprout. And most of the plants in the Cerrado will re-sprout. So this is the same species. Uh, Mimosa pterygifolia, here re-sprouting, here germinating, which is very rare to see plants germinating. So germination is very nice because after fire in the Sahara you see everything flowering and you may think, but that's common, isn't it? No, that's not common in the savanna. I think the Sahara is the only savanna where after fire you have everything flowering. The other savannas in the world, they flower every year. And this is very... This was a master student of mine. She went to the field every 15 days and then every three months. And after 15 days, plants are, everything is black in the field. But some plants were already re-sprouting and flowering. And we have the extreme case of this sedge, Bubocitis paradoxa, which can flower 24 hours after fire. So if you go to the field after fire, one day after fire, you're going to see Bubocitis flowering. So it's very fast. Anemopegma, for example, this picture I took 40 days after fire. So it already produced flowers and it's dispersing. So it's everything very fast. So you have a lot of seed input in the system. The thing is, when you look at the, the seed bank, you don't find seeds. So you, okay, you find, but it's like, you know, 50 seeds per square meter or 70 seeds per square meter is nothing. How many seeds you have per square meter release in your system? 1,000, 500, or something like this. So it's much more than we find in the Sahara. So my, always my question is, what happens to the seeds? Because plants are producing seeds. So where, what happens to, this, to the seeds in the system? Because we don't find them. We have a lot of predation of seeds. So these are two examples of, seed, of some species that we are studying, two legumes that when we, we take the seeds from the fruits and then when we try to sort them, most of them are already predated. And of course, we also have lots of seeds that are empty and non-viable. So they, can, they are produced, but they will never germinate because they are empty or they are not able to germinate. And some, and lots of poaceae and cypraeus, which are one of the major, they are two major families in this grassy biome. So this is very important. And that's, we just compared two species here. This is an annual species, and this is a perennial species. And then you can see the difference. You have 11% of empty seeds, and here you have almost 90% of empty seeds. And from the 10% that were not empty, 80%, 86% were non-viable. So the chance of this species to germinate is very, is very rare. And another point when we are talking about fire is that we have lots of species with dormancy in the system, some with physical dormancy, that fire may break the dormancy, but we still don't know how to break the dormancy of these species in the Cerrado because studying 46 species, some of them were from, from forests, but uh, most of them were from savanna. Only eight had their dormancy broken by high temperatures. So this is also something that we have to consider when using seeds to restore these grasslands. But we find some evidence of smoke-stimulated germination, which, which is really related to fire. So although these species can germinate quite well, you increase all the seeds that couldn't germinate. Uh, if you put smoke, they all germinate. They, all the viable seeds can germinate in the system. So this could be something that we could think about to use when we are using seeds for restoration. 
But the most important regeneration strategy in the Cerrado is resprouting. And when we are talking about resprouting, we have to talk about buds. And this is not only in the Cerrado, but also in other places. So here is in the subtropical grasslands. And you see that here is exclusion of fire. So two years, six years, 30 years, and here is grazing. And you see that there is a decrease in the bud bank the more you have uh, disturbance exclusion in the system. So this system needs recurrent disturbance to be resilient to, 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 to this disturbance. So if you don't have disturbance, you're going to lose all these potential stems that will come after disturbance. So now we are analyzing this in the Cerrado as well. So co do you remember the graphic that I put about the seeds per square meter, 80? we have almost 2,000 buds per square meter. So this shows us already the, p the potential to regenerate from the buds in the system. So this species here, for example, it's a very small shrub in our sites, can have more than 500 buds in one. And when it resprouts, it's just like this one here from our annual uh, burned plots. So you can see it's the buds, the potential stems, and uh, Another thing that's very important is that when you have the exclusion of disturbance of fire, you have a decrease in the diversity of below underground uh, organs. And these organs, they are very important because first, they carry the buds. So all the buds are in these organs. And second, they, most of them are storage organs. So when you have fires, usually during the dry season, so you have no water in the system, how can these plants resprout without any water? So most of the nutrients and the resources will be stored in these organs. That's why they are so important. And you lose a lot of, if you can see these pictures, you can see that it's visual. You can, and it's statistically also significant. You can see the difference of losing this diversity of below ground organs and carbon, because this is, everything here is carbon. Um, these, these buds, may be below ground, but they can also be above ground, sometimes protected by the bark. And we, also are, we are also finding not all trees in the Cerrado or shrubs have thick barks. Lots of them don't have, but the buds are protected by hairs. This is very interesting. So they can resprout from above ground sometimes, but most of the plants resprout from below ground or from the buds on the soil surface. So this is also very important to take into account. And finally, about resilience, I think this is the most important point when we are talking about the systems because the fire-prone ecosystems are re sometimes are really resilient to this kind of disturbance. And the Cerrado is also very resilient to fire. And I will show you something which is really amazing. We have some fire season experiments running. Uh, I don't know if we, can, we are going to be able to do this in the next 60 days, but... <laughs> Um, so here we have our mid-dry season fire, so we burn in July, and here we burn in October. So you can see that when you burn in July, you have a decrease in the total biomass, of course, because it's burned. But the first rainy season in February, you already have no difference than you had before. So it's very fast, the regeneration. And here is even uh, more... Uh, you can see this more clear because here is October fires, more intense at the end of the dry season. Three months after fire, you have the same amount of biomass. Here is six months about after fire. So it's because of the rainy season. It rains, so everything grows, and it's very fast. And also not only the structure of the vegetation, but also composition of the vegetation. So if you go to a grassland, which burns frequently. If you burn, it will not increase in the species, which will just recover from what it was the previous state, showing how resilient these systems are. So just showing our experimental plots. So here are our uh, mid-dry season fires, and here are the early season fires. So although this is July, you can already see that the plots we burned in May, and it was only dry, they are green because everything is re-sprouting. Slowly, but it's re-sprouting because these species have all this storage and they can re-sprout even if it, they have four months of dry season and that's not a problem. So just to 
fin to finish my talk, I just wanted to show you the experiments we have. We are playing with frequency and season. So this is a plot that we have fire exclusion since 2011. No bare soil. You have a lot of biomass. You don't have litter, usually because the dead biomass is standing in the Cerrado, so you have very few um, dead material laying on the, on the ground. These are our annual fires. So this year we burn at these plots for the seventh time. They burn very well, no problem burning them. So that's how they look like in the rainy season. And these are our mid-dry and late-dry season fires. So you see that the major difference is that they can regenerate very fast. They have a very high cover of forbs and grasses. And I think one of the major uh, differences is when you uh, burn them in different uh, times of the year is about uh, flowering, is about phenology. So, but the annual fires, vegetation is recovering, even the shrubs, they recover even better than the grasses, uh, actually. So with these experiments that we have running already seven years, what we have learned and that what we can use for restoration is that fire is really important and should be considered, could be considered as a restoration too, but if you do restoration, you have to keep in mind like this uh, framework that Giselda just showed that fire is in the system. So you will have to deal with that if you are doing restoration in the system. And thank you very much for your attention.